So I thought I'd concentrate on the main topic. Uh, I wanted to show you some pictures on how to find these lovely sites um, that you see so nicely in, in the anatomy laboratory um, in the cath lab, but I think you have seen that already. Um, <clears throat> my personal ta uh, kind of <clears throat> opinion to 3D mapping is uh, you really need to make a, a judgment call when you need it really. If you're lucky and you're, you're working in an environment where costs are not that much of a, of a bother, then you might get away on using it once in a while um, in case that you don't really need them. Um, but more and more we're under pressure to use it because it's more costly than conventional techniques um, if we really need it. And I think I'm going to try to show you that there are some, some types of arrhythmia where it's actually, I think it's a bit silly even to start without it. I think you have three major tasks to ask at the mapping system. Whatever system you like to use, whatever you are familiar with, and I have to right away say that I'm familiar most with one and not so much with the others, and I'm going to sh it's going to show very easily when um, that happens. So I want three things. I want to understand what the tachycardia is, and the system should help me to do that, because if I know already it, a, ahead of time, I don't need the system at all, and then it's just a nice gimmick. Um, I would like to help the system guiding me to deliver my ablation at the adequate site and show me, for example, if I need to make a line, if I have reached everything. You know, I'm quite aware that the red dots don't mean that I have made a lesion. It just means that my catheter was there, but that's already a good information to have because sometimes you're not aware that you've missed out some area, and at least that should be marked by the system. And then it should help me to understand if I've achieved what I wanted, if I've made a complete line, for example, and see if I can find a gap in the line. That, should again, should be easier with that using a 3D mapping system. What is a simple arrhythmia um, substrate, in my point, is something that is fairly easy to find, where you kind of essentially burn at one spot, yeah? for example, pathways. Sometimes, in, in pathways that have failed ablation, I might consider using a 3D mapping system. But mostly, we need point lesions for these kind of things. And, or, for example, flutter. We know exactly what the boundaries are. Um, Jose Angel has, has shown beautifully how to find the tricuspid, how to find the IVC end. You're essentially dragging the catheter along, and you know exactly how to find the structures on X-ray. So what do you need an, uh, a mapping system for? Now, I show you some examples on Flutter, so you're going to say, oh, I mean, you're predicted, contradicting yourself. But anyway, I think it's really important if you need to understand the tachycardia substrate so you're not entirely sure what's going on, especially if you do something that is using a lot of time and you need to get the 3D orientation correctly. For example, I think atrial fibrillation ablations is great to do with mapping systems. I know a lot of centers don't do it, but I'm quite interested also to get a good 3D geometry and use little fluoroscopy. I'm not so keen to be kind of burned in the, in the radiation. And I think 3D imaging and 3D mapping helps. When I expect multiple tachycardias, I try to have a mapping system because it's going to make it easier for me to understand, see, for example, where scars are, where predilection sites for arrhythmias are, and then I can just go and, and shorten my procedure time. But I try to do linear lesions. I also think is, it's a good call for 3D mapping. And I think you should always look for validation of your lesions, so that's helping. Basically, there are two different concepts. There are different companies providing you with one or the others. One is a sequential concept, so you collect points by moving mostly your catheter around. And the other one is simultaneous. So with one beat, with one cardiac action, with one circle uh, of the tachycardia, if it's a, a reentrant tachycardia, you have actually the whole mapping. Ideally, the simultaneous mapping systems are faster uh, because you just basically get one beat and that's cool. That's really good for non-sustained arrhythmias. And I'm going to show you um, an example here. But there's a new system that I have not actually integrated in my, um, in my talk yet. But <clears throat> essentially anything, it started with the balloon, the basket catheters, where all splines are in contact, or at least some of them are in contact. And you can have a look of how the activation wavefront runs. And again, a single beat of, of uh, tachycardia would be enough to understand. If it would be so easy, we would all use baskets, right? Baskets have not been so popular in, in the latest past. Maybe we, they have a revival now that we can look in atrial fibrillation, really complex conduction with that. So that might be an interesting thing. On the other hand, you could say, okay, if the single shot diagnostic, diagnostic, not ablation, um, is, is great, you know, the sequential mapping 
Yeah? At least takes the time to collect these information. It's important that you collect the complete information. Otherwise, um, you're losing out on important information. It requires, however, at least for the time of the mapping, that the tachycardia is stable. I think most of us have actually uh, probably already experienced what happens when the tachycardia changes from one to the next to the next, and you're kind of missing that it has changed already, and you're collecting points in the wrong map, and that is a, a small nightmare. So there are pros and cons for both. So this is the non-contact mapping system. I think uh, Richard is far more experienced with that. Um, I am by far no expert. I think I've done a total of four cases in my life with that system. It consists essentially of a, of a wire balloon that has electrodes, very small etched electrodes off the, those wires. And by using a very sophisticated mathematical um, formula, it's called an inverse solution, it projects the recorded electro, uh, electrograms from that, from that basket onto a 3D contour that you acquire by moving the catheter around. Now, I'm sure I don't have the newest software and the newest version of um, what can be shown here, and I hope the, the video ran, works. So you put your chamber, the, the basket, that, that array in, the, in a, the given chamber that you want to map. You move with your map around to create the geometry. And after that, you, t you acquire the activation, and it is displayed over the surface that you've created. You can see it's nicely, it was very nicely integrated on the Navex software. And uh, you can take some, some markers to orient yourself. I think the geometry is quite difficult to understand. I think on the right picture, you can about see that this is the SVC and this is the IVC, and you get some orientation of it. And then the next thing is to forward the slide to look at the activation so you can open that up and you can follow and these are virtual unipolar electrograms I might say so you can click on every area and you can see the virtual electrogram the system projects on that contour that you've created and then you see this wave from traveling now there is the first question just to cheer you up. It's probably a pretty easy question, I guess, just to warm up. Okay, and the results? Okay, you all got the chamber, right? <laughs> right. And it's actually the right answer, number one. Um, it's interesting because the geometry that, that was shown is not that clear. If there wouldn't have been these little markers, SVC and IVC, it probably would have been kind of possibly to be something else. You also saw the wave front traveling around and then this isthmus conduction was pointed out. I think there was quite a nice hint of what was going on. In clinical use, there's quite a lot of pro and contra on this. I think the concept is very, very, very nice, and, and actually um, I was initially quite taken. Um, the accuracy, if, if the array is further away from the wall, the endocardial wall that you map, it gets somewhat imprecise. In fact, now, we thought initially that even in, in frontal patients that have so multiple atrial tachycardia in their massively dilated right atria, that would be a fantastic system. But the array is relatively small, and the chamber is very, very large, and then you really get in trouble because the accuracy is really massively decreasing when, when you're more than three and a half centimeters away from the, from the multi-electrode array. Sometimes mapping around the array is also quite difficult, especially if you think you're mapping a left ventricular tachycardia. Some people put it... Uh, actually, I think most people took it transeptally across the mitral valve, but then you have to come retrograde and go around it. Um, I think it's rarely used in, in clinical practice. It's at least my experience. We haven't used it in the Brompton much. Um, I can't recall that we used it in St. George's in, in Hamburg very much. And um, as I said, I've done four cases. And I can't even you know, say that I have a great recollection. This is not, was very rarely done. If you look into sequential mapping, you need to collect those local signals, and that can be time-consuming, and you need to make a good judgment call on what you call your timing reference. You have several systems available. CART or Navix are the most um, well-known one, and it's really only a difference on how you locate the mapping electrode. That's the difference on the, the two systems. So here, that was the initial CART um, concept. You had three magnetic fields, and you had a sensor here on the catheter, and that would show you like a GPS system essentially where that catheter is and since you would have a second catheter on the back you would see in relation to that always how the location had changed so that's quite simple 
Now, when you do these sequential mapping things, I already pointed out that the timing reference is very important. So you start collecting these points, and the more points you have, the more accurate your, your map gets, and you can mark again uh, anatomical size, let's say SVC, and then the, tri the tricuspid annulus in this case. Um, the same is true on the right. I think for timing reasons, I'm just going to move on. I think you're all familiar probably with how that looks. And every point, maybe that's an important part, every point you, p you take is color-coded with regards to its neighbors and all the points that you have created in that map. So the earliest point, whatever you define as early, is, is red and green, blue, purple is late. Now, and some of, of the tricks that you need to find out is where the early and the late is and that gives you a good hint if that is a re-entry or not. But you need to have the window of interest uh, set correctly. So here's the same thing. I'm just going to uh, move forward. Now, I'm going to show you the maps again, but uh, my question now is, what is the difference between the two maps of the right atrium that we've just seen? And I'm going to show you... I hope we can show the, the picture again. I can probably go back. You think it's a different tachycardia mechanism, different re-entrant circuits, different windows of interest setting, or none of the above. Do you want to see the map again? Or yeah, Can we go one, one slide black, please? Yeah, just leave it here. It doesn't need to run the movie. OK, maybe forward to the question again. <coughs> Is this the amount of people voting here in the right corner? Is this the, the, the people voting? Yeah. OK, so nearly everyone has voted, 53. Let's go for the res um, result. <coughs> Excellent. 62% got it right. So we have the same tachycardia. We have a reentry around the tricuspid annulus. And only, maybe you go back to the, um, only go back to the um, picture. And the area of the early means late is in different areas, right? And that's solely defined of what you call early and what you call late. Yeah? In a circuit, there is no beginning and no end. And just what you define as the window sets the area of early meets late either here or down here. So don't go blindly where early meets late. It's just that was your decision. Yeah? So don't go a blade here because you're coming very close to the hiss, which is right here. Yeah? So make a good judgment call. And you need to understand the anatomy because if you wanted to ablate here, you could definitely interrupt this re-entry if you would make a line from the anterior aspect of the tricuspid to the SVC. You could do that. Is that a clever choice? It's a very difficult line to do. I can tell you that we've done that in the past, in our first attempts of AF ablation. And there's the insertion of Bachmann's bundle here. And I, I think Jose has, has um, shown that. It's uh, more than a centimeter thick. It's very, very difficult to block. And if you block it, then you interrupt the fastest conduction between the right atrium and the left atrium. Your P wave is going to split and lead two and it's really been two isolated P waves. It's not very clever to create such a conduction delay. And it's much easier to block it down here. Where would you entrain here? You would entrain positively all around here, anywhere, in both cases. And then we make the choice where to make the line where it's easy to reach, make the line complete, and not destroy too much important tissue afterwards. If you have the sinus, rhythm, the sinus node here, and you make a line down here, you don't delay any conduction because the activation fronts in sinus rhythm anyway collide here. Yeah, so that's why uh, it's so easy to make the line there, and it's so much more difficult to make it here and more riskier. Okay, I'll go forward because we just asked that. Window of interest. It always depends on what you want to image. What do you want to see? If you make that map in sinus rhythm, uh, you make a substrate map. You want to see where scars are or where um, previous ablations were or whatever reason is. Or maybe you just want to have the anatomy and you want to see how the sinus uh, um, activation activates that given atrial chamber or maybe even ventricular chamber. It doesn't really matter. Let's say atrial chamber. So you want to know where's the earliest activation in sinus. You need to have your window starting a little bit ahead of the P wave. And ideally, atrial activation should end at the QRS complex. So that's the minimum of your window. If you make it much longer, if you make it ahead of the P wave, you make yourself prone to mechanical extras. Whenever you map sequentially, you always have easily induce atrial extras. 
And that is picked up as very early and sites where actually there is no sinus node. So you can see that the P-wave changes and a lot of other small tricks to avoid collecting these points. You need to delete those extras. Sometimes if you have a very diseased atrium or someone has created lines or cafe ablations or something, you can have atrial activation after the QRS complex is finished. You can have that far in the ST segment. Now I've seen left atrial appendages being yeah, activated when the mitral valve was closed, just contracting against the closed mitral valve. Makes no sense, quite frankly. I think even it should be avoided. If you're pacing, then obviously the pacing area is going to be the earliest site. So your pacing artifact is a very nice thing to you know, take out for on any mapping system as the f initial marker. You try to avoid to have the pacing artifact on your mapping electrode, especially when you're very close to it. So you need to be a little bit after the pacing spike, and then again the same applies. Maybe beginning of QRS is a, is a good um, start. If you want to map ventricular activation, the same thing applies. You're just going to map the QRS complex, right? And then again, you need to have that covered. What could be a t time reference point? A time reference point can be anything that is reproducibly recognized by the system that you use. It could be an intercardiac catheter or it could be a surface lead ECG. Yeah, it just needs to be reproducibly recognized and then you can have it. Yeah, you can take it. If you're in tachycardia and you have a focal origin, again, let's say it's, a P, it's an atrial tachycardia or it's a ventricular tachycardia, you want to have your window covering the area before the onset, let's say, of the P wave. Because focal tachycardia is going to be, what, 20, 30, maybe 50 milliseconds ahead of the onset of the QRS or the P wave. You know? So you need to have that covered. If, if you make a window of interest and you don't have that area in your map, in your window, you're never going to understand where the, the earliest site is. Now, sometimes we don't know if it's focal or re-entry when we start mapping, right? There's some hints, and sometimes you just don't know. So I think you better make yourself ready to accept both options. Yeah? There's a very nice paper. I find it slightly complex. Roberto Di Ponte has published this. It's a little bit of a, of a complex um, formula behind it. What I do, let's assume this is the is a P wave or QRS complexes. You can pick whatever you want to do. And you want to cover the whole tachycardia, right? So if this would be a re-entrant tachycardia, it would be under, uh, important to have it whole covered. So you could measure initially peak to peak. Yeah? And now the question is, what is interesting in a tachycardia? You want to be... Yeah, if it's a re-entrant tachycardia through a small isthmus, let's hope that's the case. We want to be in this mid-diastolic area. We want to have that marked out. And that's why I move the interval so that it hits between the P-waves or between the QRS complexes. In that way, if it would be focal, I would see still the earliest activation here before the onset. Yeah? I could also look at unipolar signals, everything else as well. But I would not miss that area. And I have still covered the whole cycle length. I make the cycle length window 20 milliseconds shorter. So I can decide if I so call something early or late. Yeah, and that's sometimes the question, do I call this early or late? And if, that is, if you do that consistently, I say if it still touches the, the last here, the, this little thing here, this little line, I call it late. And only if it's really out, I call it early. Something like this, you need to just come up with a systematic rule. And then you can actually map the whole thing. If it's an atrial tachycardia, the window of interest, the cycle length that you display on your mapping system will not even be as long. The color range will not be as long as this interval that you have chosen here. Because it's a focal tachycardia, it's going to start a little bit before the P wave, activate probably through the P wave, and then it's finished. Whereas the reentrant tachycardia, you're going to have to map all around. You have to have signals in all areas of that window of interest. That's another nice little trick. So your color range would equal the cycle length of the tachycardia. And as I said, there's, there's going to be um, a couple of more conventional EP tricks that you're probably going to um, re get reminded during the course of this, this course here. What do you do if it doesn't make sense? <clears throat> well, first of all, you need to have acquired a point in the area that is important. If you don't have a point there, you cannot understand it. Any system is only able to show you what you've acquired. If you haven't been there, it's in the dark. You don't understand. You cannot understand. So you need to really reach every pl place. Check the color range if that makes sense with the, with the cycle lengths. 
I see sometimes people displaying maps and the cycle length of the color range is longer, much longer than the tachycardia they, they showed us that they're investigating. That can't be. Someone has, has taken an outliner and then the whole map, I can map, make any map look like a focal tachycardia and I possibly can make any map look like a re-entry, but you fool yourself. So you need to be stick to the, to, the thing, to the roots. Think of adjacent sites that you haven't reached yet and try to also always validate what you see on the mapping to your conventional EP criteria, otherwise you've got to um, be on the wrong track. Now let me show you this case. Um, as a patient after surgery, had a previously successful atrial flutter ablation. It's actually a true case of mine, one of the, I forgot which date it is. Anyway, somewhere in, uh, in the beginning of my stay in London. Cycle length is 256 milliseconds. So the patient comes from ITU, is not in a great condition, and I thought, okay, maybe, maybe this is just flutter, right? What do I do? I need to sort this person out, and I need to be successful, and, well, okay, here we go. So this is the fast first Carter map. I decided, despite the fact that I thought maybe it's flutter, I am going to use a mapping system. So we look, I'm, uh, just to show you, SVC, IVC, the tricuspid is open, propagation map. Maybe I let this run once more here. Okay, anyway, this is the question. Mm. I can go back once more. Is the inferior isthmus in this patient blocked? <clears throat> okay. Can we go back to my slides and let the movie run? Maybe only the right-hand movie? Okay, let's go back to the question. You saw these blue dots, I marked blue dots for double potentials. I also like tags, so whenever, you know, all the systems have tags, make it easier for yourself to um, understand the map. Okay, let's go for the results. Interesting. Okay, so the majority thinks it's blocked. Okay. Okay, let me go back to my slides, please. Well, to be honest, you, you probably were fooled by the presence of these double potentials, right? You saw one wavefront coming here, and then there was a wavefront coming from here, right? But the isthmus is not blocked. And the reason for that is I don't even have a point here. The color here is completely... Uh, interpolated color. There is conduction here, but I've not been there, so this is not yet possibly blocked. So here's the map at the IVC end, and I have these very wide double potentials. Hmm. And that's the two colliding wavefronts that you saw on the Carter propagation map. Hmm. So, is it blocked or not? It's quite nice because you in, I in, try to instill this doubt in you. Yeah? And the next question would be, what do I do next? What do I do? The patient is in tachycardia, obviously. Has some, then another area of conduction, whatever. Okay, let's go for the results. I think some people want to go press for lunch. Okay, good. Good. And train, I think, is a good I idea. Yeah? Obviously, the 3D mapping doesn't get us the whole information. We need to understand some, some more about this. I think to cardiovert and stop the procedure is going to get you into trouble because this patient, again, is going to have an issue on intensive care. You know, we need to be absolutely sure that this is blocked. So this is entrainment from the distal halo position on the free wall. I don't use this 20 polar thing. I just use a 10 polar catheter on the free wall. It's a cheaper option, and I know what happens on that free wall. So you see, perfect entrainment fits. So it activates around that free wall, comes down that way, okay? This is quite interesting. Look at this. This is pacing. I should have changed the colors here, but I think you can see it. This is pacing from a side where the map shows double potential, okay? And at the IVC of that, of that line, IVC end of that line, the post pacing interval is too long, yeah? But when I go to areas where it's a single potential, where the gap is along the isthmus, the post-pacing interval is excellent. And you get a PDF from that. You can measure it yourself. It actually is equal. This is where, the, where that, sit, that, that position is. I'm, I'm apologizing for the flickering. Very much on the analus end. That was where the little gap was. And when we ablated there, it terminated. Oops, 
Okay, so the take-home message here is you need to have reached that area, otherwise the three-dimensional mapping system is just nice, but it doesn't help you at all to make the right decision. Look again if it doesn't make sense. If everything else fits to re-entry around the tricuspid, you have just not reached the gap side, and that's what you need to do, and you need to solve the case correctly and not be fooled by 3D pretty pictures. Image integration. I, I don't know what the time is. Two minutes, really quick. Okay, if it's really difficult, I'm gonna, I think I'm, you're going to have to have 3D mapping. This is a very complex uh, congenital patient. There is a tunnel created in light blue and um, lots of problems. You see um, the anatomy. I'm just going to go. You can choose from CT, MRI, or whatever to understand this tachycardia. You need to sometimes make some weird access to getting to, getting to the side where, where the problem is. I think magnetic navigation is great for congenital heart disease. I know that nearly um, half of the population disagrees with me. I hope, well, let's say probably 80% of the population disagrees, but I think it's great. And I'm just going to show you, this is going to be forward. This very nice, very simple tachycardia, counterclockwise um, re-entry around the um, tricuspid annulus. Actually, I'm going to go forward here. I'm not going to ask you that question. I can tell you that we can do these procedures very easily, and I think this is just important, maybe to show once more what you can do with a 3D mapping system. You can activate, you can go for the presets with local activation time, but you could also look at voltage amplitude. This is very helpful if you want to understand um, VT. This is especially important when the patient doesn't allow you to map during VT, and you can look for, I cannot forward this anymore. Maybe it's died. If it died, then it's died. Okay, that is the final verdict. It cannot go on anymore. Lunch. Yeah? Anyway, you can look at voltage amplitude and you create your own colors as well. You can call something very early or late. There's a nice trick of do cafe mapping if you haven't bought the expensive software. Yeah? Or whatever you want to color code, you can do it on any mapping system if you like to. I apologize for the end of this talk and wish you a nice match.